Michael, how you doing? Round two. Fantastic. Glad to be here, sir. So uh, for the listeners that did not listen to the first episode uh, last week, we were chatting a lot about your scaling of zero res and the crazy things that you were doing as you were juggling with the shell game and the, making sure that you had the trucks and the people and the sales. And um, But I think what's cool about what you're willing to do for us is as you and I were chatting, a lot of times I don't have the whole... I don't have enough time to be able to get into what people do in their business and how they actually did it and the whole dynamics and the technical stuff of the partnerships and the exit and all that stuff. So this is awesome that you're able to, you know, I'm willing to share both sides, but you know, so listeners go back, listen to episode one. If you want to know how Michael took it from 300 grand in revenue to 18 million carpet cleaning. So <laughs> there's a lot of gold nuggets there, but you know, maybe Michael, as we take this kind of the technical partnership side, kind of just, you know, maybe get a little bit more detail. You were talking about your partner who was in the real estate uh, space and had a, a big challenge along uh, the 07, 08, 09. How did, how did the whole structure start? And then what was kind of the, some of the things that you guys did to kind of kick off the technical partnerships and the shares and who owned what? Sure. Well, you know, a lot of partnerships are developed with a handshake, you know, we'll figure it out. And um, I entered into this business being my my first private investment uh, via law school. And so I was not comfortable with, oh, we'll, we'll just wing it. We'll figure it out. I actually have an attorney, a friend of mine from law school. He called me as his law firm was breaking up. It was a small firm and a partner was leaving. And he said, I'm kind of screwed. I don't have partnership agreements. We don't know what the score is. We don't know how to how to plan this out. I was like, if if my attorney is in that spot, boy, I'm glad I, I mapped it all out. And and we we did benefit by having uh strong agreements. Um and I always look at uh partnership agreements uh like playing Monopoly. Do you you play Monopoly? Mm -hmm. Okay, you're an entrepreneur. Of course you play Monopoly. So um do you put money into free parking when you land on taxes and have that sort of stuff? <laughs> oh I know where you're going with this. Do you? Do you put money on free parking? Do you do you put money into free parking so that uh, when you land on free parking, uh, somebody gets a windfall and gets you know all the money that's in you, that pot? Why would you do that? Oh well, see, some people do, some people don't. It's not in the rules. It, it's not how you play. Okay. But when I land on luxury really tax, when I land, when I play, uh, we always put money into the middle. When you land on luxury tax or you, you've you got fees and things like that. And so it puts more money into the game rather than taking it out of the game. So then when someone lands on free parking, they get this windfall. Now, if you and I were sitting down to play and didn't talk about that in advance, if we didn't figure out free parking or not, first person to land on luxury tax, we're gonna have a conflict because we didn't plan out the rules in advance of the game. First of all, I've never heard anybody do that. Second of all, that's an amazing analogy. Totally thought you're going a different direction with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, uh, huh. it it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, whatever yeah, game you're playing, you gotta you gotta figure it out. I mean, cribbage. Uh, there, there's a handful of rules that you know people play different ways Can and you each other's cards, right? <laughs> Do you play yeah. that? or uh, or knobs? Oh, what is it? Uh, there's some with a. Uh, if you if you, my grandpa used to always play, if you get the opponent to cut the deck. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you you get to move forward, and I I don't know if that's the, <laughs> totally. the way you play, but but if we didn't figure that out in advance and we never played together, there's room for conflict, and so mapping things out in a control document before you get married and partnerships and marriage, it's really important. So we we started with four partners, uh, two of them exited, I guess three of them now <laughs> that I left, but two of them exited. Uh, I think the issue. In hindsight, you know there were some personality clashes and expectation differences. But the real different, the real challenge was the game we were playing was different than the game we signed up to play. We signed up to buy a little carpet cleaning company and see if we could grow it. It turned into a high-paced, uh, leveraged, run hard, twenty-four hours a day kind of deal. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that was consistent with everyone's expectations. And um, so the way we executed on the game was different because uh some parties evolved differently than others to the new game we were playing no oh, i think it's huge because like, like um another quote that i've heard from someone is like when you when you don't address something and there's there's a void people fill the void 
whether they're whether it's there or not. And so if there's a void there and you don't address it and don't set the expectations, people fill it. It's usually with worse stuff than actually is normally in the actual reality of it anyways. Yeah, I, I, I totally buy that. So we, I mean, we started uh, running hard. And as you said, uh, my partner, the lead investor who found uh, the, the cleaning company we bought, he, uh, he filed for bankruptcy. And the deal we had early on, we ended up restructuring a little bit because I took a discount on my cash. I didn't get a pro rata share dollar for dollar day one because we had an agreement I wouldn't have to guarantee any debt. So I de-risked the situation mm -hmm. um, and said, okay, I'm going to put cash in. And I'm going to get some sweat equity, but my dollars won't go as far as his because you know, he's, he, he was the big, he was the lead investor. He found the deal and he was going to take on all the burden for all the trucks, all the equipment, all the stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, files for bankruptcy, we're blowing up and it becomes clear that no one wants his guarantee anymore. They're going to want mine. So I just went back to him and said, listen, there, there was a time and a place where this deal made sense. And we were close friends and, and really had alignment. He said, that's fine. Um, so he sold me uh, a, a little bit of equity to true up the situation for very cheap. And uh, it, it just leveled the playing field and kind of unwound that discount that I had yep. taken. Did you already uh, have bought the other two partners out when that happened? Um, In your operating agreement, your buy did you have buy sells that were saying, "Hey, like here's how we're going to value the company." How did you guys end up like getting them out of the business? So um, it was very clear in the agreements that management, uh, you know, employment and ownership were were totally different boats. And we said, "Listen, it, it's not working from an operational perspective. You can keep your equity or you can sell your equity." And both parties wanted to sell their equity uh, at when their time in operations ended. Mm -hmm. um, we had um, a handful of provisions that I think are probably pretty standard in operating agreements. Um, we had drag along rights and tag along rights. So if uh, the majority of the company sold, minority investors uh, could tag along with that purchase price mm -hmm. um, and exit. If a majority of the company was selling and there was a requirement to bring the smaller investors along, you could drag them with you mm -hmm. if you had a super majority. And we also, in our buy sell, we had, um, I don't know what the formal phrase is, but I always called it a Mexican standoff. Yeah, shotgun where clause. Yep. Shotgun clause. So, um, and that, that's how I exited. Can you explain um, we, the listeners? Because I think it's, it's a huge deal that a lot of people don't know. And then there's so many people that get in some super screwed up situations because they don't have it. Yeah. And so, I mean, you can, you can value your equity in any number of ways, but at the end of the day, a, a really fair way to do it is to let the market decide. Now, bringing a third party in to be a buyer is really tricky because they're taking on your asshole part or whatever <laughs> baggage there is, right? Yeah. So it, it's really tough to have a, a fair valuation at that point. And you can say on paper what it would be worth if a third party were to buy. But we said, you know, it's more fair to say, hey, what are you willing to pay and what are you willing to buy it at? And let's have that be the number. So partner A, being me, can say, we are at an impasse. We are not making decisions in a manner that uh, uh, we're both comfortable with. We're going down the wrong road. We've got 30 days to cure it. If we don't fix things and have me call off the dogs within 30 days, I have the right to make you an offer. And that offer is going to list out the price and terms for buying this company. You get to choose whether you're the buyer or the seller. So I set the terms, you're the buyer or the seller. And it's super fair because it, it just puts the pressure on uh, mm -hmm. the other party to say, I know exactly what the deal is and I can pick whichever side best suits me. Mm -hmm. So uh, shotgun clause. So and we'll get into how that actually went down for you, but it's a little, let's kind of go back to the, the se sequence of the story. So as you then shored up, were you 50 50? And like, what was kind of the, the timeline? Or you, did you say you had one other investor at that point? So like, kind of walk through like the, the, the timeline of the we, we had another partner who he had the carpet cleaning experience, he was kind of the lead who brought the parties together. And the thought was he'd be the general manager. His I won't say his pedigree was inconsistent with expectations, but he was the, the way he executed just was inconsistent with 
with our value system. Mm -hmm. We were all about building people up and giving big hugs. His experience in the cleaning industry had him uh, more of a top-down approach, and it just it just wasn't a good good fit. And uh, so, you know, I think there were some hard feelings and some frustrations and. I think he uh, had a big smile on his face for many years when he left because he got a big check. Um, so at that point, um, uh, when he exited, um, I was still, I had put less cash in. Uh, so I was 43 and a half percent of the Minnesota operation. Mm -hmm. We decided we'd go 50, 50 on all future ventures. So we bought a building and sold it. We bought a second building, 50, 50 partners. We set up a company that scraped a royalty off of several of the businesses 50 50 um so I'll, I'll walk you through kind of the capital structure that we yeah, have so we, awesome. we opened like the entity structure because like um even before you get into that i'm curious michael did you write a check for that other the owners or did you finance them i'm just kind of curious because as as people are wondering like okay how do i what's the best way to do this you know so maybe kind of address that and kind of get into the entity structure and the capital structure so we we did uh, sell our finance terms, um, and it was uh, both personally guaranteed and guaranteed by the equity. So uh, they had kind of a what do you call it a, a trust set up where um, the and that's not the right word, um, but like, the almost like a double backed guarantee where like it's almost like you're the primary lender, like a bank for the most part. Right? Yeah. So the the equity that he the individual sold secured. Uh, the loan. So if we stopped paying within the 36 month period uh, that we had terms for, he could take back the portion that hadn't been paid for. Got it. Okay. So uh, secured by the equity as well as secured personally um, through, you know, just a uh, guarantee. So um, in 2013, um, we opened another location. Um, we opened in Omaha and it was kind of by accident. We thought, okay, it'd be cool to vet a new market, but there was a former employee who had a ton of cleaning experience. And my partner was really excited about investing in him. And I said, you know, I understand the business. I understand the model. Yeah. I don't believe necessarily in the guy, but I, I feel like uh, the risk isn't that great. So we went to the franchisor and said, you know, Hey, here's what we're looking at doing. We got some good terms. And we put some money in, we brought in an operational partner who was our general manager as an investor. And because we were opening in Omaha, we asked the uh, owner of the Des Moines franchise if he wanted to come along because we thought it'd be fun. And it was kind of his natural next step to open another market. And, and we didn't, I, I, we were more about making friends than making money. Uh, both were important, but friends first. And we said, you know, hey, we don't want to step on your toes. Are you interested in doing this with us? And if you have any hard feelings, you can do it yourself. He said, nope, I'll, I'll come along. He set up a company uh, with his dad to invest. And so we actually put cash in um, and we brought along, we were supposed to be minority investors uh, and the former employee who uh, had the concept to open Omaha, uh, you know, he said he had a lot of money. It turned out he had a very little amount of money. So he came in with about a quarter of the cash and we picked up the rest. So he most of his value was on sweat equity anyway. So not a huge deal. Um, I think I had, um, at the end of the day, 23, 24% of that business. We then decided, well, okay, Omaha is working. The model, we vetted it. It makes sense. Um, we know how to buy the media, run the trucks, and organize this thing kind of using a hub and spoke where the Minnesota operation was doing the administrative stuff mm -hmm. and the field ops just had to make sure that the the guys in the trucks were working. Um, so did you, in Minnesota. Quick quick question on that. Because uh, did you, when you have different entities and stuff like that, I know a lot of people when I look at their books, they get, they don't have like bill twos or like where like, you know, the home office is building. So that way you've got like a standardization of like, okay, if this is a standalone operations, like this is exactly what the p &L would look like. You got that or... You, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure I understand your question, but where what I would say the organization looked like is we had uh, an operating agreement, a service agreement that okay. said, yeah, yeah, yeah. here's what the Minnesota operation is going to provide, and yep. here's the fee it's going to charge. Okay, yep, that's exactly. Um, so it was it was contracted out, and it gave each of the members 
unilateral right to kill it with 30 days notice. So cool. yeah, yeah. you don't like the way we're answering the phones or like the fees or whatever, yep. kill it. But cool. we're going to be without phones in 30 days. Yep. So no, that's exactly what I was Yep. Yeah. Okay. So it was customer service, marketing, finance, um, and procurement. And truthfully, it was management as well. So it was a, the Minnesota group through that contract was taking the burden of running the business. We had a general manager in place and that person was in charge of making the trucks and the people run uh, out of state. So we said, you know, this model makes sense. Let's, let's do it again, but let's feel a little smarter. Um, Thus, the unwinding of my uh, my business relationship. So it was the beginning of the end. Um, we said um, we met with a group called Platinum Management. Uh, they do turnarounds and growth strategies, and a uh, really good firm of investors and business professionals in the Twin Cities. And met with them. My partner knew uh, their managing partner through church, and we sat down and we rolled out the big ideas. We're gonna. We're going to keep 50% of the equity. We're going to bring on an investor group that's going to take 40% of the equity, putting up 100% of the cash, and 10% of the cash raised will go to the company, uh, the Platinum Management Group, for finding the investors uh, because we didn't have investor networks uh, that were robust. And we also said no friends, no family because Mm -hmm. we wanted it to just be business didn't want to complicate things. And you can't see me on this podcast, but I'm winking because that's not what happened. So we also said no waterfall distributions. Um, We're not going to take a backseat just because we didn't put up the cash. We're bringing expertise and we have a real opportunity cost. We're doing this instead of something else that can make us good money. Mm -hmm. So we thought we were going to open 10 franchises. We went to the franchisor and they said, yep, you can sign a contract to open 10. But they had brought on a third party uh, to negotiate the deal. And he said, nope, you get one. And we said, that's not at all what we had expected. That's did you have the inconsistent. Money um, we did not have the money yet. Um, but we were making plans, we're spending money. Um, we brought on a, a firm that did market analysis in uh, 10 or 12 locations, helped us try to identify if the magic in the Twin Cities uh, and what we thought the drivers of that magic were could be duplicated in Pittsburgh, St. Louis, Cincinnati, mm-hmm. um, Charlotte, Tampa, um, Seattle, and full others. I'm really trying to quantify, okay, here's the mojo. Where else does that same mojo exist from demographics, psychographics, et cetera? Mm-hmm. And so we're spending a little bit of money. Franchisor has some tomfoolery. We said we're not going to negotiate with that guy. And we flipped the table. And we said, listen, you, the franchisor had been trying to raise capital for growth uh, for a couple of years unsuccessfully. They had tried the debt markets. They had tried uh, to sell equity. Nobody wanted to play. So mm-hmm. we said, how about we be your lender? We will uh, buy equity in the Minnesota operation, the Omaha operation, and future franchises that will open. We won't pay you. We'll stop paying you a royalty. And they said, huh, that works. So we bought equity in our business, assuming that we're able to make a cash flow. Mm-hmm. And we gave them a million too. And they said, that's great. Everyone wins. And I think they were laughing all the way to the bank. And our bankers laughed all the way to write us a check so that we could do the deal. Because within two months, we were cash flow um, from having not... Uh, change the relationship where we didn't have to pay them a royalty. Yeah, you, yeah you've got a <laughs> surplus. So curious in that negotiation, Michael, like did, did you guys ever, th- and you kind of almost stepped right into the direction I was, the question I was going to ask, like, did you guys ever think about buying just the fran- franchise, the whole thing? Because with how much- like, We did. Yeah, with, with, with the machine that you were running, like why wouldn't you just go for the whole thing? So we looked at it. Um, first, their self-confidence was a little higher than uh, their balance sheet. Um, <laughs> And so they they wanted too much money. But second, we started doing the deep dive and I met with some people in franchising and came to terms with the notion that your customer is very different as a franchisor. Your customer is the franchisee. And I realized I was great and really enjoyed working with a team 
who obsessed about the homeowner mm-hmm. and developing a team that was going to obsess about the franchisee w- was a very different game. And I didn't pick the existing lot of franchisees and um, there were some great ones and there were some that uh, How many were there at that time, uh, probably 25, 30, okay. somewhere in there. Um, it just, we realized it was a different sport and uh, it was not the sport we wanted to play because we could have an easier path to making great money and having fun by mm-hmm. opening more franchises. Mm-hmm. So we worked out with the franchisor. We set up a company that um, would sign the franchise agreements. And that's really all those companies did. Those companies raised money and signed franchise agreements. They had management agreements and contracts with other entities to run their business, which was the Minnesota operation. And they agreed to pay a below market royalty to an entity that my partner and I owned because they didn't have to pay a royalty to the franchisor. So everyone agreed and okay, yeah. it just shifted the relationship. And we became kind of a de facto franchisor. I'm just going to say without, you're, you're taking the override instead of the franchisor, right? Because we, we paid it forward up front. Yep, yep. And it, it's a 40-year agreement that we have with the franchisor. So uh, that's a, a little bit unique in franchising. Um, it, as long as those don't go out of business, um, uh, we're pretty happy. And I have exited the operations and exited the equity, but I still get an override on every dollar that is processed. So I have basically a parking meter uh, until until I don't. 35 years, whatever you signed it. Yeah. <laughs> Another 30 some years. So where things went sideways um, with my partnership, um, we bought a building uh, in St. Louis Park, uh, suburb of Minneapolis. And I think that there were some challenges. Um, We bought it from a friend of my brother's um, and the deal shifted a little bit. Um, It looked less and less like a super friends and family deal and more and more like a retail deal. And it's what we signed up for. But I think there was some, I got some sideways looks from my partner. Turns out where the market has gone since 2014 when we bought the building, we've done very well. Um, we bought the building for a little over six million. We think it's worth probably seven and a half or eight. So it we're doing just fine. But I think it started a rift where uh, in spite of having been a trusted teammate, I think there were uh my partner had some questions about was this above board, et cetera. And, you know, I was in the same lot as him. I got the same deal he got. It didn't go the way we expected. So, you know, we kind of paid the price together, but I think he still uh, had some questions that had he dug deeper. Yeah. Had, had he dug deeper, I think he would have understood that the guy who has had his back and treated him like family still had his back and, you know, uh, paid the piper just the way he did on the the real estate transaction. But contemporaneous with that, the deal to open our next locations where, where we got that royalty discount went sideways. And I, I will take some of the blame for it, but of the provisions that I mentioned to you, no waterfall distributions or preferred distributions to investors, it, an equity split amongst the way that I talked about and no friends or family, those three provisions we adjusted as my partner's son came on as the lead investor. He had made a ton of money in real estate in a couple of states. Um, he had uh, great cash flow and millions of dollars. And my partner really wanted to bring him in. Okay. So n- no friends and family. We changed that one. And he started negotiating the deal which we had said we wouldn't do. We had said there's plenty of money out there from plenty of people who want to play the game we are trying to play. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't worth standing my ground at the expense of possibly screwing up a partnership that was working really well. So we gave his son a little bit more equity. We gave him preferred distributions. Can you explain the preferred? uh, Because, you know, the waterfall. First money out. Yeah. First money out. So he put in into the first business, he put in, you know, a couple hundred thousand bucks when distributions were going to uh, start happening. He would get his money back first 
and then other investors would get their money back and then we would be caught up. So what it did was change the timeline on cash flow for for yeah, people in my shoes. Yeah. And on top of that, we had set a plan out. We're going to raise $2 million. We're going to take the money in in three chunks and we're going to have some extra money, but we're going to be overcapitalized so we don't screw up. And we're going to have the ability to play some consolidation within a dysfunctional franchise system. Mm -hmm. Well, that shifted to let's raise on a case by case basis, dramatically less and do it on a budget and have to beg for money when we want it to go do another project. So a whole deal more. Yeah. Like, because I mean, you know, how, how hard are you going to negotiate with your partner's son when he has a completely different vision of the type of deal? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and frankly, you know, my partner went to the cabin, had a bunch of beers and worked out the way it was going to work. So his son went into the, the conversation expecting something different than had been arranged by myself and my partner. So it's not that I didn't negotiate. It's not that I uh, accepted all of the revisions, but a version of change happened that was not on the table uh, when we set out to do the deal. So there's a bit of a rift, right? Um, there are some challenges and we're working through them. It, it got a little hot and heavy. His son said, all right, let's exit. You know, I'm, I, I, I don't want to do it. Talked him off the ledge. Uh, we were already pregnant. We were already running forward. We had people hired. We had locations picked out. We said, all right, I'll suck it up. I, you know, I'll make it work. So we're running forward. That was, you know, end of 14, beginning of 15. We launch in Pittsburgh. It blows up. It goes gangbusters. Day one, we've got four trucks, one employee, <laughs> and a uh, $25,000 media spend with no revenue. Month two, we cleaned somewhere in the sixty or seventy thousand dollar range. So we turned on the lights on radio, and it just took off. I mean, it went better than pro forma, best case scenario, and we're just running like crazy, hiring people. And it it did a million bucks its first year, and nobody could spell zero res. Um, <laughs> so we're we're winning all over the place. Um, so we decide twenty sixteen we're going to open up St Louis, we're going to acquire Savannah, and buy part of Charlotte. So we take on more. Things are, are going okay. There's some challenges, some confrontations. I, I had a couple conversations with my partner about our core values and how we're making decisions. Uh, but a, a conversation topic had consistently been twofold. One, stay out of operations because a, an owner of a business that has management below them, when they step in and talk out of turn, to say so you go into the, the garage and you've got a mechanic and you start coming up with ideas about, well, what if we did this? And what if we did that? You have undue command influence. You, mm -hmm. They take it as the law. The boss is telling me to do this. But the, 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 the uh, actual boss, <laughs> the, the mechanic has a boss who has a boss and they set out his quarter and his priorities, his KPIs. And all of a sudden he's got, you know, he, he thought he was going right, but now he's going left. And so it screws up the system. We had consistent conversations about the difficulties and challenges. And, and my partner would say, you know, I'll stop meddling when people start doing it right. I said, well, you got to give them enough leash and authority and autonomy to be able to succeed. And so nobody's right or wrong, but where the rubber hit the road was that it was disruptive. Uh, I call it whiplash. Everyone's supposed to be looking left. Partner walks in the room whispers some sweet nothings and they're looking right. Yeah. And it, they get yeah. whiplash and the team, it leads to dysfunction. Um, it's not the only traction or EOS or anything like that. Yeah. And is that you're during that process for you in name, but not in uh, job description. So as the owner of a company, my partner had a real hard time having a job description and on the job description, it said, stay in your fucking lane. <laughs> and it, you know, but he he saw himself as chief disruption officer. He's supposed to take systems and break them and reorganize people. You can do that, but that's why you have an integrator in traction terms or a COO. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the CEO has this great vision and they need to run it through the person who's going to implement and make the trains run on time. They don't get to go and meddle in that same way because it, it leads to dysfunction. So that was issue number one for me. Issue number two was there was always a group of employees that was close 
to my partner. We would call him Jim's guys or Jim guys. Cause they drink beer in the back of the shop with him. He, he had a level of trust with them uh, that extended beyond business. And the conversation was basically, they would have to murder someone to get fired. And even then it's unclear if they would uh, get fired, um, which you know, made it very difficult for the operators of the business to make business decisions about uh, the team. Mm -hmm. So some, some crap went down um, at the end of 16, where um, a decision was made that preferenced certain individuals at the expense of the team undercut the team to take care of a guy. And I get why you take care of the guy and why you would give him the hug that you give him, but not if there's collateral damage that sets back the whole trust level of the rest of the organization. Called him out on it and said, listen, I've done a lot of thinking. Um, we're kind of co-visionaries, co-CEOs, and I'm going to step back. And I don't, I, I'm going to exit operations. I'm going to hand you the keys because uh, one, I think I've got lots of other fun things I can do. I can add value in the business, sitting in my role on the marketing team, on the finance team, and as a person who has the job of, you know, helping position the business and, you know, thinking five years out and figuring out what business lines we need to get into. But but I'll stay out of the I'll stay out of the EOS meetings. I'll exit the leadership team. But it requires a handful of things. One that we operate traction in its purest form, where you have a job description and you stay in your lane. Two, you uh, deputize our chief operating officer or integrator to really do his job, and he's running the company day to day. And three, that the le- rest of the leadership team holds everyone accountable and doesn't let bullshit slide through the cracks. Mm-hmm. And And I said, listen, I don't want to move your cheese. I'm not trying to screw up your game. I'm not trying to break up. I'm trying to find a reasonable way for us to execute better because what we're doing is dysfunctional and not working. Mm -hmm. So it got a lot worse and then it got a whole lot better. And we we hit a groove. We hit a, a rhythm where we're making good progress. And I think everyone was feeling really good. And then at the beginning of 2017, uh, excuse me, 2018. Um, so 2017, we're implementing this new system where I'm kind of on sabbatical. You, I was gonna say, so you were kind of like almost a board member for almost a year then while that was all going on? Oh. Active, but yeah. yes. Um, so uh, I was meeting with all the players, but I was clear to not give direction. I was just, you know, listening and giving advice. And and uh, I had a role on the marketing team and the finance team and cool. uh with visionary owner operator, visionary integrator owner meetings. So I was meeting with the COO and mm-hmm. with my partner once a week to, to help make sure that the big ideas are going the right direction and their job was to figure out how to execute. Well, I think, you know, before you kind of <laughs> give the second part of the story where it's a second kind of see where it's going to go, I think it's an interesting pause because, uh, Michael, a lot of people that I talk to and entrepreneurs that you and I both know is, I. A lot of people think it's not possible to do that, you know, where they have to be a visionary or they have to be the integrator and they can't be a board member and still talk about the things that they want to talk about. You know what I mean? Like where I think a lot of people think that they literally have to go out the pasture where I, t- I argue all day long, you don't have to do that. Like you can do kind of what you just described where you talk about the interesting things and the players that be and still have an important role. So I just think it's interesting that you actually accomplished that before things went south. It it was very challenging. Uh, it had a level of uh, humility that I had to come to terms with, but it. I think it could have been magic. I mean, we we had a an ATM. We had a a business in Minnesota that uh, had two hundred thousand customers in its database. Hard to screw up, but there is a lot of opportunity for improvement and prioritization and big ideas. Um, and I was still uh, a vital player in uh, the marketing world. Um, so I, I still did have uh, some control. And, you know, I, a month, it, between that and breaking up, uh, it was much preferred. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it took a while. It got way worse than I thought it would because I think my partner felt abandoned. Um, he felt like I was taking my ball and going home, like he was going to do all the work and, you know, and I'm still getting a paycheck. and. 
did you, know, you it, did you re um calibrize or recalibrate the um the pay that you were getting compared to like what you were because i think that's sometimes a struggle of like getting actual w2 wages for employees or would just was there an agreement like hey we both get the normal ownership we, pay? we had conversations uh and we did not make a change uh and my position would be that the the wage we took was not ceo wage to begin with mm -hmm. um we weren't we were taking most of our money through distributions. The other element that had me feeling very good about not adjusting my pay was the work I was doing was uh, effectively as a media agency. And when you compare what I was being paid to what a third party would be paid, which is typically 15% of a media buy, I was dramatically underpaid. Yeah. Um, because we were, you know, across all our bases, we were spending close to 2 million bucks on radio, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a million and a half, 2 million bucks. 15% of that's a big number. I, I wasn't yeah. close to that. Yep. So, um, and you know, that, that was uh, part of the strain and strife as we were figuring out how to operate, but we hit our groove. We started to come to a really good spot. And meanwhile, I'm still having conversations with my partner about behavior and, and how we operate. Then, then the shit hit the fan at the end of or the beginning of 2018, we always did our holiday party a little bit late and it's a holiday party story. So um, <laughs> there's a gentleman who ran uh, one of our operations and he also was the, the manager of managers. So he managed the guys in who ran St. Louis and Charlotte and Pittsburgh. And he was a pretty big deal. He was on the leadership team and he did some bad stuff. It, Me Too had just become a thing, uh, the Me Too movement. And so everyone's on heightened awareness of sexual harassment and sexual impropriety and what consent means and all that stuff. And, you know, the guy, the guy fucked up at the Christmas party. He, he made some people really uncomfortable at about 2 AM. Uh, he beat the piss out of a key team member's boyfriend, like oh um, beat his face in. And so we sit down and we have the conversation. What are we going to do about this guy? And um, it's pretty clear that, there was some coaching that needed to happen and probably some disciplinary action. Um, the, the correct step that was taken was he stopped being affiliated with all of the other locations. And so his relationship with the Minnesota branch was largely severed because Minnesota had the contract to be the support network for all the other locations. But two things happened. One, uh, there was no discipline in terms of uh, his role or termination or coaching and counseling that, that met any uh, high standard uh, uh, in his core job. And two, my partner went on kind of a retaliatory tirade um, going through, you know, it, it came out that, that this individual had uh, slept with one of his direct reports and, you know, the general manager uh, sleeping with a, a, a technician. It's really hard to get consent there. And it's just bad behavior. Now, my partner would chalk it up to he's an outdoor cat. He, he's got outdoor cat etiquette. You can't expect him to be an indoor cat and not chew up the furniture. Oh, now geez. that's a, that's a, rough, that's a rough we, we have, argument. we had females on the leadership team. We had, you know, a ton of females and a ton of people with, with daughters, that type of logic doesn't really cut it. No, especially as me too is becoming like this massive in your face thing where companies and individuals are being blown up all the time for behavior I, like that. I have a stomach ache just hearing. <laughs> the, I won't give you the anecdote that uh, was the worst thing I've heard uh, a business person say, but there, there, was, there was some feedback about one of the girls who had seen some stuff and the, the way my partner talked about her and marginalized her view and her just in general shit on her uh just it there there was no recovery uh there was there was commentary made that that just made me made it clear that um i had i had wondered about the character of the person i was working with and it became hard to get past that that commentary but what really happened that changed my game was the leadership team that I had said one of the, the roles mm -hmm. we need to have in, in me not being active is we need to have a strong leadership team that has alignment with our visionary. 
And the leadership team wrote a letter to my partner and said, we're not going to work for you anymore. These are the changes that need to happen. We don't respect where you're coming from. We don't think your behavior is appropriate. And so we've got an empire that pays for my kids' daycare. And the team that largely executes on the plan is saying, they're not going to take this shit anymore. Mm -hmm. And my partner thinks I authored the letter. He thought that I was, you know, the guy with the pitchfork and the torch and, you know, trying to string him up and whatever. I, I was a sounding board and I expressed my dissatisfaction, but I was not a ringleader. I didn't push for dysfunction. I didn't want his job. And mm -hmm. what I said to him was, listen, um, something needs to change. You're, you're losing the confidence of the troops. And so you can take a sabbatical and I can step in for a couple of months. You can get a coach and get on a plan and show that you're, you take this shit seriously, or we can do anything else, but the status quo, something's got to change. We mm -hmm. can have you take a, a sabbatical and I won't step in, mm -hmm. you know, just let the team run and we'll be you know, without a, a visionary for a little bit. Let me know. But if we don't do something, we're going to break up. Got no feedback, no critical thoughts. It, the feedback was, we don't have a problem. Just because they say we have a problem doesn't mean we have a problem. <laughs> so I told him and the leadership team that I was using the control documents and it was on 30-day notice that we um, were at an impasse and we had 30 days to work it out. And I said, take it seriously now. You can be part of the process and help come up with a solution. We can talk about value or in 30 days, I can give you a number. Got nothing. So before 30 days came up, I said, here's going to be the number. And my partner, he's in his 60s. I, I had thought I'd be a buyer, but I was okay being a seller. He said, I'm buying. So there we go. How, how did you value it in that? Was there some mechanisms that you had put in the document that was like, how, was it multiple of EBITDA or discounted cash flow or just you come it, up with a number and that's that? It what? was a standoff. It was the Mexican standoff. So I could have said it's worth $4 or $4 million or $400 million. I needed to be prepared to write the check or to sell my interest at the, the number. So I picked a number that was not as high as it could have been, but it wouldn't have screwed up the company's ability to operate mm -hmm. because you know there, we built something beautiful. I wasn't trying to burn the house down. And you know, all kinds of tomfoolery happened after that. Um, there were it was it was a painful, tough negotiating negotiation, getting everything together because we we had other interests. Uh, we had the out of state businesses that needed to be agreed upon because I wasn't going to, you know, play a silent role in him executing on these growth plans. We had the building, we had a lease arrangement between the, the company and the building. It did come together. Um, there was tomfoolery uh, that I'm glad I wasn't a part of. Um, and I think that if I were, I'd probably be pretty ashamed of myself 20 years from now after, you know, the cooler heads prevail. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, there are moments I wish I had conducted myself differently and uh, presented arguments rather than emotion. But I think, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot to have learned from having gone through something like it. I wouldn't wish it upon anybody. It was just a messy, messy thing. But as we're, as we're having a conversation, um, the, the fact that I was trading misery for dollars became so clear. Uh, when I said to my partner that, listen, um, I assume you're going to ask me to, to sell or finance some of this because we're dealing with pretty big numbers. Um, my willingness to do so really hinges on your relationship with the leadership team. Have you taken steps to rectify the, the shit show? Uh, because they had written you a letter that said they lost trust in you. And what have you done to fix it? He said, Michael, those who don't want to be here will leave. So he's the guy who hops on an elevator reeking of garlic and, and shit that he just walked in. And he's saying, I don't smell anything. So, yeah. okay, it, 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 he, he has no role in it. Everyone else is blind. And if they don't want to be here, they'll, so be it. So when the dust settled, a handful of people left, hand, 
full of people stayed. Um, he gave a lot of raises. He cut a lot of, you know, reorganized the company. And I think uh, uh, there's some thinking that's probably pretty short-sighted. And there's some thinking that is brilliant that he's executing on. And, you know, they'll go where they go. But where where I live today, um, I'm pursuing private equity investment and doing turnarounds. I've got a building that I still own uh, with, with my partner. And I've got a company that scrapes a royalty with my partner. So I've got two assets that I think uh, will be wealth generators. I have no employees or problems, and I've diminished the influence of my relationship with with a, a he, person that I, I think exhibited some bad behavior. Did he write a check to you, or did he finance it? Or if you weren't willing to do the seller financing, he brought on uh, some. It's part of a franchise system. He brought on some uh, friends who own franchises. Uh, in the same franchise group and some of their friends and associates. And he wrote a check. He also, I don't know uh, all the details, but I, I think he sold some real estate and refinanced his house and his cabin and all that to buy me out of the out of state stuff. But the wire was good. The, uh, the, uh, the, the cash is in the bank waiting to go to the government on April 15th. <laughs> so it what? all went through. Michael, what is the, when you look back at starting at like kind of the, the one degrees that shifted right around like the, the building and stuff like that throughout that whole journey, what's like the biggest thing you think you learned about yourself? Um, I think that I, I started to feel like an apology, wherever you're, uh, I'm going to piss some people off, uh, but I don't know them. And so I'll say it anyway. <laughs> and I don't know your politics, but um, I'm, uh, I'd love to to call myself a conservative, but I am a conservative liberal. Um, I'm socially liberal and fiscally conservative. Uh, so I'm not represented by anybody in politics, but there's this lady named Sarah Sanders who it feels like she's an apologist for madman and she's had to openly lie. And I started to feel like that um, as I was softening the blow of things my partner had said and activities he had engaged in. And I just started to realize I was trading misery for dollars and should have left the business two or three years prior. And it's not that I didn't play any role in that misery, but I got not complacent, but I didn't see a path to change. And I think the thing that I learned is first going into a, a partnership or a business uh, negotiation I need to be very principled and pick my spots differently and more carefully. And second, making sure that whatever I'm doing, I'm having fun. I'm working with good people and people that I want to work with is a priority. So I don't know that it necessarily means I would have done things differently in organizing the business. Maybe I would have had some different criteria and different conversations. But you know, my my partner was never going to be active. Uh, we didn't know the real estate world was going to blow up, and you know, he was going to have a, a a need for income uh, such that he needed a job. Didn't have an expectation that we'd grow a business that was going to be worth millions. But I think I uh, it has changed my perspective about how I move forward in future business decisions. I think that's super fair, and like, and maybe that's a good segue as we're kind of wrapping up here, like. You know, with the, with learning of who you're doing business with, because I think money and people are so tied together. And you, when you have those two tied together, you see the true true nature of people. And then you put like self survival mechanisms in place, and shit gets ugly really fast. So how does that impact your decisions of what you're doing now? The business, you know, kind of. I know we kind of explained in the other podcast, but again, you know that now with the true nature of what you've gone through, kind of explain what you're doing, what, like, how do you sure boxes that you want to check? Well, so I'm, I'm a, I guess a professional investor. I'm running a private equity firm and we are, uh, we've got two verticals. One, we're investing in small service companies buying a minority stake in, you know, a roofer or a window washer or a, you know, carpet installer or whatever. Um, and we're coaching those people up. I'm sure uh, we have a, a checklist of criteria uh, that you know we won't invest in someone if we wouldn't want to sit down and have a beer with them or a coffee. We want to make sure that we've got the right relationships. 
Um, the other vertical, we're, we're just buying companies either uh, as part of an exit strategy or a succession plan for someone who's built a great business or doing a turnaround with a business that needs capital for growth, leadership strategy, something like that. And picking the, peop- the types of situations we're stepping into, we won't trade misery for dollars. If it's just dysfunctional, but could be fun to fix because we're working with good people, I'm in. If if the people are mean spirited, or um, I, I just can't see myself enjoying time with them, we'll pass. Um, it just money is not worth that much um, if if we're not happy engaging uh, in the activity. And and perhaps just as importantly, there's a recognition that we're uh, we're fundraisers. You know, we're bringing on third party money to execute on these these business activities. Mm-hmm. And all there's a recognition that all money has personality. And I'm not going to take money from people that I wouldn't want to have a beer with. I wouldn't want to have a coffee with. My partner's son, whether you think he's a good person or a bad person, he exhibited the way he conducted himself can be written off in any number of ways. You can say it was his first investment deal with partners, et cetera, et cetera. But the the tone of the conversation was unhealthy from day one. And I had outside influences that had me stick with that line of investor longer than I should have. But for my partner, I would have run like hell. But to save the relationship with my partner, I said, well, we can make it work with this son, even though there's all this crap going on. And trust me, I'm, I'm guilty in some of the conversations. Uh, I said some things that... Uh, uh, could have easily been misconstrued or come with personality that wasn't intended, et cetera. Um, so I, I learned a lot about that, but I would say all money has personality and really be careful about who you get in bed with, because I know, I know some very affluent people where I wouldn't take a dime from them because I, it's just no good or bad to it, but they they don't align with my value system or what I'm trying to accomplish. So well said, Michael. I mean, I think so many times people have these stories and it, it just comes with a price. I mean, there's the terms, but there's the unsaid terms that are really the unsaid terms. And then the conversations that you're going to be having with these people that are, you don't know until you know. <laughs> yeah. Wisdom comes with winters and and you got to, you know, go through some crap to really figure it out. And I, I think that I'm a pretty principled person. And in going through this crap, I've realized that I got to stick to my guns and follow my principles and don't make excuses. I, I had plenty of conversations with my partner about, you know, we've got these values, these core values that are supposed to guide our decisions and they're on the wall. And the entire leadership team and myself included feels like you put an asterisk next to them and say, yeah, these are how we make the decisions unless Mm-hmm. Unless it's one of my guys, unless it's this situation, unless, and if you're willing to veer, you just confuse people, and you're a lot less productive. And I think people are a lot less happy because um, you're not you're not following the the plan. If our listeners want to know more about your plan, what you're doing, and bounce ideas off you, what's the best way to get in touch with you? So um, we have started a company uh, that doesn't have a website. It's called Booyah Capital Partners. Uh, very professional, right? <laughs> Booyah. Um, but we're, um, w- we've got a website uh, called uh, redhookinvestment.com. And it's a way that people uh, can reach out. Uh, there's a little form that uh, if, you're, uh, if you own a business, it can ask three questions and says, hey, do you want to have a conversation about a potential investment, even if you just want to shoot the bull um, and talk about uh, football or um, whatever, as long as it's not uh, talking about how cold Minnesota is. Happy to have the conversation, redhookinvestments.com, and just say, you know, you're open to have a conversation with Michael, and uh, we'll go from there. But I I want to thank you for having me on. It's been a a ton of fun, uh, and hopefully, you know, the dysfunction I've gone through and, and all that pain can uh, be relevant and help people avoid some missteps and uh, or at least be a little bit entertaining because honestly, knows? man, like uh, you have to say is like it it's huge and like I'll I'll thank you again because so many times on this show people don't share this and this is the shit that really goes on, man. You know what I mean? And like so like 
people have really, really great stories, but there's always people and money involved in every one of these stories. So whether they're true to the situation or not, it's been awesome hearing how you guys built the business, but then being able to share the stuff, you know, people actually are going to relate a lot to this. So I appreciate you coming on the show a lot. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure.